So starting the thing at nine o'clock, yeah. creates a, he starts it at six o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, so I'm share screens. I do believe I'm sharing. If but, you want to share, uh, share, please share. Yeah. Uh, Lionel did ask me to. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just probably jump on if you look like you're going over time because we do have a full um, program. So if you do look like you're going over time, I'll jump on and just move you along. And yeah, and as, as you just saw, it's like we are recording and we are basically hoping to figure out a way of how to make them accessible so that people can actually look at it after the conference as well. Yeah, so will it go up on the, like, on the website or something? Is that um, I think we very likely trying to find a way to basically send out links to them. Yeah. So sure. that we have them on the website or some repository and then kind of like uh, links. I mean, obviously, Butlin will go up probably on social media, et cetera, but like, I think the rest will be a little bit more it's like spamming with 30, not spamming, but like putting out 30 presentations might get a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. It's like we, we're still discussing and then hopefully the idea was to send it out to um, people who registered to kind of like, look, here is, here is uh, kind of links and everything. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Um, all right. I suppose we're just about at time. Um, yeah, so we've got three really good papers, um, more or less about the interwar period internationally, which um, I'm looking forward to hearing. Um, if you're okay to start, Pierre, uh, from ANU is, is our first paper on active land markets and property rights in Indonesia in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, sorry, Pierre, I can't hear you. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yep. I'm trying to think of a solution. Yep. <laughs> Shaking in unison. Sorry, mate. <laughs> Do we want to? You want to try and should we change order and you could yeah. play a little bit with with? Is anyone of the other two presenters willing to uh, to start? Sort of, yeah, take one. Okay. Please take it away. Okay. Can you see my PowerPoint slides? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let me start. So, thanks for the conference organizers. So, uh, the paper I'm going to present is about the transfer protection clause and also it's about the Taoist plan, which I, I would give you some uh, introduction. So, let me start from the historical background. So, roughly between 1924 and 1931, Germany absorbed lots of capital imports, which was amount to about 20% of its GDP. And in annual terms, the capital flow to, G to Germany uh, inductive of reparation was about 4% of its national income. This is also quite a huge amount by modern standards. And at the same time, during, uh, Germany's foreign debt was building up and at the end of 1930s was about one third of its national income. And this capital inflow actually reversed uh, around 1931 and with the, the top two bottom drops in the net capital inflow, the capital reversal was about 6% of its uh, uh, national GDP and capital inflow and capital outflow, they, they were among the main driving forces of the Germany's business cycle between 1925 and 1931. And this has already been identified by the literature, even by narrative method or by qualitative model 
Okay, and and Germany is also not the only country that has experienced this kinds of capital inflow and reversal because of many European debt countries, as I'm going to show you in the next uh, table, has experienced the same uh, the, the the same problems. But Germany stood out in the amount of capital it has received and also the amount of uh, the subsequent capital reversals. And one important feature is those capital inflows and outflows, most of them are private uh, natures, not official natures. So here, in this table, I show you uh, certain countries. Uh, as you can see, the first current report, the country include Austria, Finland, Germany, Greece, and et cetera. And the second and the third column is the net capital inflow. A positive number means net capital inflow, and the negative number means capital net capital outflow. As you can see, Germany alone uh, absorbs over fifty percent of the capital inflow to this region, and just to be followed by Austria and also by Hungary, Italy, Poland. And then in the subsequent period, uh, Germany experienced the largest capital outflow, and it's also dominates all the other countries. And the last two current just report number in terms of per capita. You can see uh, in a German case, it's still the largest one just to be next to Austria. In terms of the per capita capital outflow, it's just next to the experience of Finland. Okay, that so far, what the research has done, they have quantified and they have made sure the, the amount and so the effects of this capital inflow. But still, there is a question which the literature has not answered is, what is brand this capital search and capital reversal to Germany? And now the standard answer is provided by Professor Richard okay, uh, from the LSE, a serious paper. Basically, he said that uh, the, the reason for this capital fraud and reversal is because of the transfer protection clause of the Davis plan. So I'm going to describe a little bit his story. Okay, so according to the Treaty of Fesaia, reparation was senior to commercial claim, uh, that, that's normal. So, so the treaty provides that uh, the partition claim has absolute priorities of payment by Germany over commercial debt and all the other government obligations. So if there is new credits, because credit has junior ranks, so it would be the first to be default if Germany suspend the payment. So making it very different for Germany to obtain new credits and any reasonable credit would not give new money to Germany. But uh, since changes when uh, the Dutch plan was adopted in 1924, so the Dutch plan basically provides Germany a return to the gold standard, a rice mark, a new currency, and a stabilization uh, loan is about 800 million, and also a payment schedule for the reparation. But most important for our purpose is a transfer protection clause. Okay, so the transfer to the reparation creditors, the victory uh, allies, was entrusted to a transfer committee. And the committee was composed of five uh, LS experts and headed by the agent general for reparation is Americans. And uh, now it's parent uh, provide that the reparation transfer shall only be made if this did not damage the German gold standard, does not damage the Ger German exchange rate. So if there is a danger, then the corrected uh, gold market, the corrected money will be deposited at the uh, account by the Bundes by the right banks. So under the transfer protection, the Reich banks, the central bank of, of Germany, uh, the Weimar Germany, will only make foreign reserve available for uh, transfer for reparation payment only after the commercial claim on Germany has been satisfied. Okay, so this effectively uh, reverse the ranking of reparation and commercial debt, so that if there is any shortage of foreign reserve, commercial claim will be first service and at the cost of the reparation. And so th this is brand, the reason why Germany at that time actually was over indebted, but could still attract so much foreign capitals. But uh, from some political point of view, the clause also creates some perverse incentive for Germany to over borrow because as a internal document of German foreign minister short, the more uh, foreign credit we Germans take in, the less we Germans will have to pay out in reparation. And it's even suggested that the foreign policy under Gustav's treatment, the German foreign minister was simply to take foreign credit hostage to the reparation problems. And, and then uh, since change again, when the Taoist plan was adopted in 1930, so 
Dow Spring actually is a complete and final settlement of the Great World reparation. And um, it was concluded in, in Paris in 1929 and quickly is ratified by the German Congress. And in terms of payment, it's more stricter than the Dow Spring. And, but most importantly, the young parents abolish the transfer protection clause. So um, this make reparation again senior to, to the commercial claim. And there is some report that uh, after the abolishment of the young parent, even at the times of the nego negotiation, the German bonds issue abroad actually almost came to a standstill and foreign credit stopped and the foreign credit crisis is, is quickly approached. Germany. So that's the story provided by Professor Richard. Okay. So, but to the best of my knowledge, um, I, I find so far there is no empirical studies on the above, I would call it is a hypothesis of the transfer protection clause. Um, the, the, the hypothesis actually provides a theory about the introduction between the Persian policies and the capital flow to Germany. And this is a, an aspect uh, even ignored by the designers of those the Stoic plan. And this has this hypothesis is so popular, it has been accepted by popular, uh, popular writings and even appear in high school textbook. And also it's uh, widely accepted by academic community as these two papers I cited here. So here my purpose is to use a, a solving depth model and I calibrate the model to the interwar Germany's and I, I examine whether the effect of the reparation arrangement really has some effect on capital inflow in Germany. And the, the reason I use this is model because I also emphasize that uh, in, in the case of the, the reparation problem and also solving lending in general, the willingness to pay is more relevant than the ability to pay, okay? So more specifically, I examine whether the adoption or the transfer protection can really quantitatively generate the dynamics of the actual capital flow to Germany. And I find that uh, this so-called transfer protection clause, they, doubt, they cannot account for Germany's high level of foreign debt. And that, that's because uh, reparation policy, they, they don't change the debtor's willingness to pay and they don't change the credit's willingness to lend. And therefore they don't matter uh, really, uh, really for capital flow. Instead, I provide an alternative explanation. I suggest that moral hazard problem is a more plausible explanation for Germany's high level of foreign uh, high level of foreign debt. Uh, okay, so so if, just to give you some intuition, why uh, the, the transfer protection clause is a really beautiful theory and it's so attractive. The first time I read it, I almost uh, accept it without any doubts. But why it, it doesn't work is because suppose now. Reparation, they are really senior to private debts. Okay, so and suppose the maximum transfer we can take from Germany is given. So reparation and commercial debts, these are two mutually exclusive claims. So the more Germany pay for reparation, the less it can pay for commercial claim. This is the substitution effect. So in the sense that uh, uh, reparation cross our commercial claim and vice versa. Okay, but the problem is the, the maximum transfer we can take from Germany is not fixed, but it depends on the enforcement of the payment. So if there is a strong enforcement, then it would increase the maximum transfer we can take from Germany. So here comes something like a wealth effect in a, in the sense that a greater enforcement of reparation increase the total amount you can take from Germany and even pay for reparation. In our model, the wealth effect dominant the substitute effect, so that uh, the seniority of reparation uh, actually encourage, can bring in, but not cross out private capital flow. And the literature so far, especially those provided po by Professor Richard, they emphasize only the substitution effect and they ignore the uh, wealth effect. So because of time constraint, I'm going to just present an analytical paper and the key result of my simulation. So the analytical uh, model is a version of the Ethan Kesselbitz model and following the modern exposition. And this is the current workhorse for the analysis of solving debt and solving default. And this is standard small open economies and has the standard preference. As you can see, here CT is consumption, use the utility functions as a discount factor. So this is the lifetime utility function. We assume this is an endowment economy. So uh, each period, so the economy receive an endowment YT, and YT is an AR1 process uh, like this. 
that each period the economy can start either from a good financial standing or a bad financial standing, and the economy acquired a bad financial standing if it default and its foreign obligations. And once it default, the economy is, is good it's from international markets, but it still can regain access to financial markets with a constant property CETA. So in, in average, the exclusion duration from financial markets because of default is one over CETA. And the, also, um, I follow a that uh, once a country is in default, then it's encouraged to break up causes that is also exogenous given. So as you can see here, if the economy doesn't default, then it's a, output is equal to the endorsement. If the economy is before, then the output is um, endorsement minus a loss function. So the loss function is a non-increasing function in YD and has these kinds of quadratic specifications. Okay, so basically a default would cost the economy, bring the economy to punishment. Uh, one punishment is the loss of access to international financial markets, and the other one is the loss of parties endorsements. And if the economy is excluded from financial markets, then the economy is forced into autarky. So you can see the, 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 the agents can consume uh, only the endowment. So this is the budget constraint under autarky. And economy in the good financial standing can choose whether to honor its debt or to default. And if it choose to honor its debt to continue to serve in the debt, uh, then uh, it can borrow again from the international market. So this is the budget constraint and the good financial standing. CT is the consumption, and DT is the debt to at period T. White is the endorsement, and DT plus one is the, is the debt issues at this period, but it's going to be due next period. And QT is the price of this debt. As you can see, the price of debt depends on the debt due next period, and also depends on the current endorsement because we are soon endorsement is theory corrected. So the, the current endorsement contains some information about the future uh, endorsement. Okay, so now I will give you a little bit of formulation about the value function. I know it's a little bit, uh, uh, maybe somehow complex, but it's quite standard. So if an economy is a good financial standing, the value function associated with is a CTV. So you can see, this is a Bellman equation. The first element here, the utility of this period. Then here is the utility starting from the period T plus one and discounted to the current periods. We assume you continue to serve your debts then starting from the next periods by in a good financial standing. So here VTG stands for the value function of being in a good financial standing. And here E is the expectation. So uh, because here we have a random variable YT. Of course you can, Side to be to four and in a bad financial standing, then your value function is going to be uh, by VTB. And this is the my equation the, for the current period utility. And this you have a CETA probability to regain access to international financial market and to power again. Still, you have a one minus CETA probability to be continually excluded from the financial markets. And for an economy and a good financial standing, it can decide whether to continue to serve the debt or just to default. So if continue to serve the debt uh, in more higher utility function, then it's going to continue. Otherwise, it's going to choose default. So we can, we can show that default is more likely if the level of debt is higher, and default is also more likely if the endowment is low. Okay. And now I can calculate the, the, the risk the, the, the interest rate. So I assume uh, there is a risk-free real interest rate it's by a star. And also we assume foreign creditors, uh, they, are, they are simply risk neutral. They are perfectly competitive. And I can calculate the price of debt. It's simply the probabilities of land for divided one at one plus a star. And then uh, here is the country interest rate. And then I can calculate the risk premium the country interest rate uh, minus the world interest rate and the trade balance is just the difference between YT and CT. So I solve the model using numerical methods and I use a value function iteration over discrete state space to approximate the model's uh, equilibrium uh, dynamics. So now I will, uh, this, I will skip the parts about the model calibration. So, but give you some 
some uh, feeling of it. So this is an upper cost of four. Uh, the blue line is the 45 degree nine. So this is the output. If there is not four, but it's, there is a default, the output is going to be kept from the above. So it become constant. This is the parameter of the, the models. So basically I followed uh, one principle to calibrate these this, uh, parameters. These parameters are calibrated to match two features of the German economy at that time. First is the default probability. So in, in the study periods, the Germany average default 2.6 times per hundred, okay, hundred year. This is the average debt to GDP ratio is about 36.7%. So I use these parameters to match these two features. And this is the risk premium. This is the volatility of risk premium, the correlation between risk premium and output and the correlation between risk premium and uh, uh, trade balance. Okay, so I, I will show you just one uh, empirical analysis. And, and in this analysis, I, I try to quantify the interaction between reparation arrangement and also capital flow. And I assume that reparation is imposed with certainty. And I also consider the cases when the reparation is imposed with uncertainty, which is more close to the real world, but the result is almost the same. So I, I don't present the result here. So the reparation in the model is as uh, like a, a fixed tax on Germany's output, okay. So the tax will be export and tossed into the sea, and the tax will enter into the economy's budget constraint. So with probability PT, the tax will, will be be wave. So if PT then it goes to zero, this means the tax is always active. The tax is like a reparation; it's senior. Uh, it's like a senior tax. The budget constraint under financial standing and financial standing will look like this. So this is uh, like uh, equation 14. This is equation 15. One is up here uh, on the right hand side and the other appears on the left hand side, such as expenditure. Okay. So if Professor Richard's hypothesis is correct, then once I impose this reparation on the model, then I, I was able to simulate a much lower sustainable debt than a benchmark model. And not only the debt level has to, to fall, but a reduction must be quantitatively uh, really important and re relevant. So I start from the case is that- Just a couple of minutes left. Okay. Mm. So I, I start from the cases that PD is equal to zero. So uh, this is going to be, become the new constraint. And, and um, okay, the problem is how to calibrate the tau here. So I, I take this tau value from uh, the, the literature. Is assume that the average reparation mental GDP ratio is about two uh, percent. Just show you the so here. The second row is the benchmark model. Here, the second row is the the model with the reparation payment. So I can see the simulated results are almost identical, which means that the Starting really matters for for the for the capital inflow to Germany as a as represented by the second column. Also, you can raise the reparation payment to as high as ten percent of GDP. This number is not taken arbitrarily. This is I take from the experience of the the Franco push award, which at that time the German imposed in the in in indemnity on French is about ten percent of the French GDP. As you can see, even if we raise the tau to 10%, it almost remains identical. So the question is why the model's prediction uh, must support uh, Professor Richard's hypothesis. So simply said, so on the one hand, positive evaluation is equivalent to increased output losses uh, in a default state. We know that uh, in a standard Eaton case of this model, the, the higher output loss you inc incurred, the more willingness you are going to pay. The lenders, they know this. So it's going to sustain a much higher level of debt. On the other hand, the reparation reduces the disposable endowment under financial standing. As you can see, the disposable endowment is reductive of this payment. So this reduces the incentive to pay the to pay, pay, pay the, the, pay. And the former increase and a little reduce the willingness to pay. So in also at the end, they offset each other. So making it doesn't make any difference. Okay, so um, 
But please allow me several minutes to finish this example. So with current model setup, I can still go a step further to discuss a, a misconception about reparation policies. So it's often suggests that a, a regional policy still impose reparation when Germany was able to pay, okay? And it, when Germany was 94 and should waive reparation when Germany was unable to pay and in a divorce state, just in one word, please be kind to, to the Germans. This is some people suggest. So to model these policies, I allow the T difference depends on whether it's in default or whether it's a uh, financial standing. So I can show you that uh, once one is equal to one, which means you don't impose any punishment, any, any reparation when Germany is in a default state, then no debt will be sustained because the, the borrowing countries, uh, for the borrowing countries, utility function under Oktaki is always higher than the utility of continue to serve the debt. And the credit non-use, non this at the beginning, and then they, they will refrain from lending money to Germany. So the good intention to relieve Germany reparation burden at the default state actually deprive Germany from borrowing abroad. We can do it another way. So we impose a higher punishment on Germany when Germany was in default than when Germany was in a good financial standing. So then we can show that the equilibrium to GDP ratio actually increase. So for example, if I set tau one equal to 4% and tau two equal to 2%, the equilibrium to GDP ratio will raise from 37 to to almost uh, 90 percent, and the default frequency also decreased substantially. So this skin uh, that's imposing higher reparation the default state actually enhanced Germany's capacity to pay and put in uh, private capitals. And I, I can find a historical episode which is consistent with my interpretation. This is the, the franco prussian war indemnity, which is about five billion francs and was raised through to domestic bonds issue in. 1831 and 1832. And these were heavily oversubscribed and many of these bonds were actually purchased by foreigners. For example, when the second loan for, for the 3 billion uh, francs was opened, the subscription was 12 times the amount desired and more than half of the offer actually comes from foreign countries. A large part is from the, the Germans. And so far the literature has attributed the, the French ability to raise from uh, due to the ample international liquidity at that time. But according to the interpretation of these models, the ability of the victory Germany to impose reparation on France well, was probably equally important uh, to make France able to borrow abroad. This is because the investors, they, they view France as a safe place with little solving risk because the lenders, they knew that France knew the Germans who will not leave France until the indemnity was paid. And Germany was able to credibly impose sanctions on France in the case of France default. Just remember that Bismarck uh, won the troop to occupy France un until the indemnity was paid. So the France intent incentive to default was substantially uh, lowered, and this increased the foreign investors' uh, willingness to then to France. Okay, I think I will stop here and wait for the questions. Um, if there is no questions, then maybe I can present the last result. Mm. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, we're more or less uh, close to out of time, but we do have time for um, a question or two. Florian. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying that like whatever triggered the reversal, it wasn't Germany. So it wasn't that imposition of that or the change in the clause that made Germany now um, kind of like change the, the perception of like whether Germany should basically be a worthy borrower or not. So if I understand it correctly, and your model essentially also is better just looks at the country versus the rest of the world, if I understand this correctly. Yeah, yes. So according to Professor Richard's interpretation, mm -hmm. the reason for the search and for the reversal of the capital flow are exogenous given. They are due to the uh, uh, allies reparation arrangement. So it starts okay. from the Taoist print and then, uh, and then follows by the young print. But according to my interpretation, uh, the problem is homemade. It's because the, the German banking systems, they suffer from the moral hazard problems. So maybe I can show you uh, this can figure. I, can I ask, like, where does the money come from? Like, uh, who mostly, is, who is for? mostly coming from the United States. So United States provides about over 50% of the lending to Germany. And that's what I have described in another paper in, in 2019. 
Okay. Yeah. And you know, because what I'm trying to get to is like the story kind of argues a lot coming out of the, the reparation structure and Germany, but it doesn't tell much about the, the source of the money or then if you take the ones that call it back. And so if something happens, I mean, obviously the US runs through the Great Depression into the 1929 and 31, like runs through financial crisis. So how much of that is driven by, how much can be explained by like the Americans just stopped lending um, regardless of what, what the, the clause is, regardless of what the Germans want, because they kind of like decided they needed the money domestically. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so far, I, I only try to quantify the effects from the domestic uh, German factors, but I still have to go a step further to, this is the demand side, okay? So, yeah. but you are, you are asking about the supply side and the supply yeah. side is not deal with in my current papers. And I probably have to figure out what's the, the contribution of the supply side, especially from the US capital, uh, which start to lend to euros uh, after the currency stabilization and start mm -hmm. to withdraw from euros after the uh, stock market bubble burst, yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Any other questions? All righty, we're, uh, we're more or less on time. Uh, so we'll move on. Uh, Pierre, we're, we're all in the chat, so we can see that Pierre's gone through it. Um, and so we'll uh, move on to Gertjan. Is that how you say, you say your name? <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, are you able to share your screen? Not yet, because uh, I'll try now. It should work. Yep. Yep. Are you able to share? Uh, All right, I'll, um, I'll get in touch if, if you're running out of time, but otherwise take it away. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, let me present our new working paper. Uh, this is a paper with uh, Gustavo Cortes from the University of Florida. Uh, we changed the paper slightly to our previous um, our previous uh, working paper. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear any thoughts you have. So the idea is that we uh, focus on pandemics and whether or not they kill the live insurance sector. And we go back to the Spanish flu to uh, understand both short-term and long-term impact of, of uh, that pandemic. So before uh, I go into uh, the paper itself, I wanted to give you a brief overview of what we do know uh, in terms of the, the impact of exogenous shocks. So the conventional wisdom in the life insurance or insurance literature says that if um, there's an exogenous shock, insurance companies in general reduce their prices. And this has multiple explanations. For instance, there is a the constraints, uh, capacity constraint theory from Ron and Winter, who say that, well, since there are more liberal, um, there's more coverage, more liberal underwriting standards that will lower prices because uh, profitability is also low. So to increase profitability, those insurance companies charge lower prices to actually get more coverage back to them. Then you have a very influential paper by Cummins and Danzon in, in 1997 that says, well, um, that is also true because um, the price of insurance uh, policies is inversely related to insurer default. So um, insurers who charge higher prices are more likely to um, uh, run into financial distress later on. And then you have Cohen and Yogo who says, well, this is, this is all very true, but it's also a lot driven by both financial and product market frictions. So leverage, according to their model and to the empirics they show from the Great Recession, so 2007, shows that, well, leverage does play a huge role, but also um, the fact that competition increases a lot after an exogenous shock, that leads to lower prices. So if we combine these four papers together, the, the hypotheses currently in the literature are that uh, live insurance companies are going to decrease prices more first when they are more heavily affected by the exogenous shock. So with a higher balance sheet shock, 
um, firms with lower asset growth will also charge lower prices uh, to attract more customers, also those with higher leverage ratios, and uh, according to the capacity constraint theory, those insurers who have a or, or had last year a lower capacity to take on new um, to new uh, insurance policies will also uh, charge higher prices. So if you don't have the the capacity to take on these these um, these insurance policies, then this will also heavily affect the uh, prices you have. So then. Our key takeaways from, from our paper um, is that, well, we somewhat see that insurance companies do reduce prices. There is a negative relationship with financial quality, which is similar to what Cummins and Denzon are saying, that it's, it is related to uh, um, financial distress. We also show that it's um, both affected by leverage and product market friction. So, uh, the capital structure does have an, a huge influence, but also competition. However, what is the key difference? If we focus on a pandemic, we find that price reductions are smaller for uh, more affected insurers. So if you are an, a live insurance company who was more affected by the Spanish flu, then you actually charge higher prices relative to, um, to your competitors. And the rest of the, the hypothesis, we also find that the price reductions are lower for those live insurance with higher asset growth. It, those are higher for uh, leverage ratios. And we also show that this is driven by lower capacity. However, right now we show there's a, a small disconnect with the literature that if you have a larger balance sheet impact, the price reduction will be smaller. So, Let's take one step back and now go through the entire paper. So what we did is we um, hand collected the um, balance sheets of live insurance companies in the US. We use uh, the spectator because it's a very comprehensive source. So we include all live insurance companies with at least one year of data before December 1918 to really do a difference in difference um between between companies so we include all uh live insurance companies with at least one year of data but we exclude all what is called retirements so um live insurance companies in financial distress who went bankrupt or um who changed their name um that is also something we exclude uh, in in the first stage at least in the second stage we will include them as well and also every live insurance company who got incorporated either in 1918 or afterwards as well those uh, we exclude as well at least <clears throat> in the main specifications we also compare our results against those new incorporations but for the majority of the paper we exclude all new live insurance companies um, so we start collecting our data in 1911 up to 1922. So we have a, a rather long uh, and comprehensive data source available to us. Uh, now, if uh, the spectator um, had rather low quality, uh, then in that case, we're also going to use best as a secondary source to really check uh, whether or not our, our numbers we do find in terms of balance sheet do make sense uh, or not. So what is the data we have? Well, we have balance sheets, which is total admitted assets. So that is the size of the life insurance company versus total liabilities. We also have the income statement, uh, which is total income versus total disbursements or total costs. Now, what we also have in terms of income statement is a very comprehensive list of how many new life insurance products they actually sold, what the dollar value of those life insurance products are, but also the reason why uh, specific life insurance products um, got cancelled, either through death 
they were lapsed, surrendered, or uh, anything else. So we have a very nice breakdown of the reason why uh, specific products actually uh, got wiped out. And also we have some uh, additional firm characteristics, uh, what we call geographical diversification. Um, so we know uh, in which state a specific life insurance company was active in. Um, and we also know the reason why they actually retired. So that is, those are also things we're gonna take into account here as well. So to give you an idea how many firms we include in our sample, we excluded and the number of bankruptcies. So to give you an idea, the number of firms we include is 274. Um, and you also see there, there's a relatively large sample we're excluding. But what I at least found very striking uh, when, when we looked at this, this figure is the number of bankruptcies. Because now we highlighted the influenza pandemic period, but you couldn't really tell if we didn't highlight it, I believe, when the influenza pandemic actually happened. So there were already quite a number of uh, firms uh, in financial distress before the, uh, the pandemic, but also afterwards. Um, and that is something we're going to explore later on as well. Um, but also to give you an idea, uh, the number of new incorporations and what we also found very striking is that in 1919 was actually the best year for life insurance companies uh, in terms of supply. So there was a huge uh, supply shock going on. Uh, and uh, to give you a preview of the reason why is because uh, when the, the Spanish flu occurred in 1918, there was actually a, a sort of very good education for um, the US population to really see that the, there's a lot of attractiveness going on in live insurance. So there, you, you'll see one of the next figures I'm gonna show, there's gonna be a huge increase in demand and that demand was met by an increase in supply of life insurance. So to give you an idea where these life insurance companies were active, it's largely in the Midwest. So uh, I'm not gonna try to name all of the states because my geography is not that good, um, but you see Indiana, Illinois, Texas, those uh, states were very active in terms of headquarters. So the figure you're seeing right now is whether or not a live insurance company had an headquarter in a specific state. So there are only three states without any headquarters. That is Alaska, Canada, and Arizona. Apart from that, every state had at least one headquarter. Now, if we show the picture for business, so whether or not they did a specific business in a state, the figure sort of looks the same with a large focus on Midwestern um, states. So that's why we are only going to show uh, in terms of headquarters, but the business side, as, uh, as I said, we're going to take into account as a control variable for the geographical diversification. So to give you a, a very, very brief introduction to the Spanish flu, for those of you who, who don't know, um, so the first case of the Spanish flu in the US was in March 1918. Uh, it was considered very severe. The case fatality ratio is 2.5%. To give you an idea, a point of resemblance for COVID-19 in the US, it's 1.7 uh, today. Last year in Australia was 1.2%. So it, it's relatively severe. It's, it's double in terms of case uh, ratio. However, the first wave of the Spanish flu in, in the US was not very uh, deadly. The second wave, unfortunately, was way more significant and way more deadly. Um, and then there was a, a relatively small third and fourth wave in 1919, 1920, but this was more a local issue. So in New York, there were still a few outbreaks, but it was what not widespread as the second wave was. So the second wave was really the unfortunate thing uh, and why the Spanish flu 
is, is so significant that was all due to the uh, second wave. So then the data we're gonna use for the Spanish flu comes from uh, Clay et al. They have a city and state level mortality data, which covers about two thirds of US urban population. So it's, it's very comprehensive and very detailed. So that is what we're gonna use. And we're gonna match this source with our accounting data. So we are able to construct a measure of mortality on the firm level. So we really know, depending on how much business a specific insurer did in a state in 1917, we are going to calculate an, an weighted average mortality rate. So let's say you're only uh, you're an insurer only in one business, which was uh, heavily hit by the Spanish flu, you're heavily hit. But if you're active in 50 states, then we're going to take the mortality rate of those 50 states into account with the weights of how many business you did in those specific states. So the end result, which is going to be interesting for our purposes, is either be, going to be a more affected treatment group or a less affected life insurance companies control group. And the definition of more affected is if your um, mortality rate on a firm level is above average, then you are in a more affected treatment group. So then, as I uh, promised, I'm going to show you the growth in new issues. So uh, how many uh, new policies people actually bought. And there you see a huge spike in 1990. So on the first hand, it was a, a very unfortunate education in the attractiveness of life insurance, uh, life insurance product, the Spanish flu. What is also present here in 1919 is um, a lot of veterans going to war, uh, US, the US entering the, um, the World War I, although it was in 1917, there was still a lot of programs like the war risk insurance, that was still going on around that time. So the, the huge spike is both Spanish flu and uh, somewhat of the aftermath of World War I, which we're also gonna take into account later on. But this is something which we found very interesting and which we're gonna explore later on as well. So now there is only one year where there is a, a negative growth rate and that is the, um, the recession following the pandemic later on. So then our research question is, well, how did the Spanish flu impact the life insurance sector? So these are the, the variables we're gonna, we're gonna use and we're gonna focus on, uh, which is follow the standard practice in the literature. So size is a log of total admitted assets. We're gonna focus on the real price. So uh, we have the value the dollar value of new contracts. We divide it by the number of new contracts and we scale it back to uh, with the CPI index because there was a lot of inflation during that time. So we got a real price measure. So this real price measure is actually the average, the average real price of a, a live, insurance, live insurance company. Then we also focus on the capacity, which is the surplus you, you put against new contracts, uh, the growth rate, some profitability, the leverage measure is the capital stock divided by total, at, um, total admitted assets. Then we have some liquidity. And as I said, we are gonna focus on the number of states a firm has business. So these are, these are the numbers. Uh, so to give you an idea, the size is on average, it's $1.9 million. Uh, the number of states is not, and the average life insurance company is active in just above nine states. Um, so th these are the things uh, we are interested in. So the correlations also among those, those variables is not super high. Uh, apart from size and uh, geography, for instance, which doesn't make sense. If you're bigger, you're more likely to be active in, in more states. Um, so these are not things that, that concern us uh, very well. So 
which uh, model are we going to use? Well, in the first stage, we're gonna, just going to use a, a simple difference in difference, where, as I said, the treatment group are all those live insurance companies with a mortality rate above average. The controls already defined, so it's going to be asset growth, size, profitability, leverage, liquidity, capacity, and geography. We're going to use state, firm, and year fixed effects, and we're going to cluster our standard errors on the level of the insurer. Okay, so again, if we would just take one step back and look what conventional wisdom tells us, well, they tell us that the price reductions are going to be lower, are going, sorry, are going to be larger for firms with a higher balance sheet impact, it's gonna be lower for asset growth and higher for leverage ratio. So we're gonna assume a, a negative relationship with leverage, positive with asset growth and um, negative difference in difference. Okay, so now if we actually go to our model itself, first, we're gonna focus on the secular effects. So there we see that there's a negative trend. So following the pandemic after 1980, from 1980 onwards, you see there's gonna be a drop in prices, which is similar to what the literature actually tells us. More interestingly though, if we focus on the, um, the companies that were more affected, we actually see a positive relationship. So this means that the overall trend is negative, but live insurance companies that were more affected actually charge higher prices. Then we show that there's a positive relationship between asset growth, also size is positively related, uh, and leverage, as the other theory predicted, is a negative relationship. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to extend this difference in difference by focus on the different time periods. So we're going to focus on the period during the Spanish flu, which is 1918-1919, and then after the outbreak of the Spanish flu, which is 20, 21, 22, to really see what the timing of this effect is. And there we show that, again, there, there are both the negative trends going forward, but the timing is mostly situated during the outbreak of the Spanish flu, because after here, it's still a significant result, but here, uh, if you include more control variables, that significance actually vanishes. The only significant that remains is the period during the Spanish flu. So the effect we find is driven by 1918, 1919. Sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah, so take with... Sorry? Yeah, um, so yeah, it's not gonna be very long anymore. Thank you. Yeah, so um, our key takeaways from, from this is insurance companies do reduce prices following a pandemic, but the results are situated during the outbreak. And for the rest, we do find similar results as before. So then I, I promised we're going to talk about uh, World War One as well. So that's why I took a quote from Faulty Towers. So there, there are two key endogeneity problems here. So first, you have World War One with a lot of veterans actually going to war. So that's gonna increase the sales of life insurance products, but also unfortunately, a lot of soldiers dying, which are gonna increase debt claims paid. So to balance these things out, we're gonna use hilt and runs mean distance to military camps. And we're gonna use this as an instrument for asset growth from 1917 onward, because in 1917, you have the sales, and from 1918 onwards, potentially the debt claim paid. But also, we're going to cancel or delete all retired life insurance companies because that could also have a significant impact. So, this just to show you very briefly, we do still find the negative secular trend and um, the um, the second level interaction. So, more affected companies still charge higher prices, and that effect is still driven during the Spanish flu. So even if we take all of these endogeneity problems into account, our main results still hold. So what about capacity? There is something we're gonna focus on directly. We're gonna focus it on in difference, in difference, in difference. 
where treatment one is still the mortality above average. Treatment two is whether or not you have more, more capacity uh, to take on new products than average. There we find still there's a negative trend that is still significant. We find still that more affected uh, insurers still charge higher prices. But now what is also interesting is the capacity, which is negative, meaning that um, the effect of the more, uh, more affected live insurance companies that charge higher prices is mainly driven by those companies with lower capacity. So if you are affected but have lower capacity to take on these products, then you're going to charge higher prices. And again, we're just going to highlight this is uh, across the board significant. So during uh, there's a negative secular effect and the capacity matters a lot as well. So then last question, should we care? Well, we believe you should because we're, if we are going to focus on financial distress, so if we're going to focus on all uh, live insurance companies who uh, got bankrupt, you see that mortality plays a huge role, but indeed real price also plays a huge role. So real price is a significant predictor of uh, bankruptcy. So an increase in the price increases the likelihood of going bankrupt. Size is uh, negative, which means smaller companies are more likely to go uh, bankrupt. Leverage also significant. Now, if we just delete all the retirements uh, following name changes, then the, the main results still hold. So you don't have to worry about that. Mortality is significant positive, price significantly positive. Um, so it, this does have some real effects. Then lastly, some, some additional results. So we also focus on the financial and product market frictions. So we do find similar results, meaning higher leverage means lower. Uh, no, so more affected means lower leverage. In general, HHI means competition. So there was an overall increase in competition, not specifically uh, in the states where uh, insurers were more active. But also here you see the product market friction that if you are more uh, more affected life insurance company, you're less likely to enter or to stay in an affected area. Other companies are more likely to enter. Uh, we did some, some additional checks. So if you winterize the data, so to uh, exclude outliers, the results still hold. As I said, if you compare our results to just the new life insurance companies, you also find a disconnect in prices. If we create cohorts according to asset growth, there we also find that it, this, is, this is not driven by those companies who grew uh, a lot or uh, grew nothing at all or even shrank. Uh, if we control for the average price of the products that are already on the balance sheet, this is also all significant. So our main story holds. And what is our main story? Well, insurance companies do reduce prices following a pandemic. This is driven by the likelihood of default. This is driven by financial and product market frictions. But more importantly, we show that um, affected live insurance companies actually charge higher prices and this is uh, most likely explained by the lower capacity to take on new products so as we have shown this has some real impact well this could have a general impact on the fragility of the live insurance company okay thank you so much thank you um, happy to hear if there are any questions yeah sure we've got a, a couple of minutes uh, for questions uh, Florian, yeah. So how does, I'm trying to get my around, it's like between the profile of those, of the mortality profile of the, of the pandemic and those that are insured. So I can obviously see the kind of like demand factor just coming purely out of like, there's a newspaper about like how many people die and we have like lockdowns and all this yep. other kind of stuff. But did you actually, like, in the sense saying, like, are the people that are dying in the flu, through the flu, are actually people that hold life insurance? And in some sense, like, is there an actual direct so, impact on the business? Or is it sort of like, they actually, well, they're all too young or all too old. So therefore, there's not actually any kind of impact on the direct business. 
So there's there's another study who tackles exactly that point. So uh, more than 80% of people in the U.S. held life insurance. So that's that's higher than people uh, nowadays. Um, and she finds that the increase is more in the uh, it's not so much in the affected areas. It's just across the board. So it's not that the people who, who were dying suddenly are going to buy or family members are going to buy those life insurance companies. It seems really across the board and not driven by something real specific. Um, but the, the overall uh, likelihood of owning a life insurance company was higher then than it is nowadays. Okay. And so that is I don't actually, know if answer your question. Um, slightly in the sense of like, you obviously have the impact on new business. That's basically what you mean. But it's also like the, the, the impact on existing policy holders. So in a sense saying like if probably 2% of my policyholders die much earlier than they expected to be dying, then that has an impact on what I have to pay out. And so the question is like, yeah. is that the case or is that the case that like people die and it actually then don't have to pay out? It's the kind of thing. So um, we don't tackle that directly, but we do find that uh, life insurance companies uh, especially those who were only active in, in one state. In general, they were, the bigger life insurance companies were situated where more people lived. So we do find similar trends. So to us, it seemed like natural that the bigger were also where the people were. So we do not know specifically one by one if that's the case, but there's a, a very good indication that there were not a lot of people living in Alaska and in Hawaii, and there also we don't see a lot of business. The business was in Boston, in New York, uh, where also the, the population was. So um, we believe it's somewhat representative uh, right there. Okay. Thank you. All right, um, any, any other burning questions or, or quick questions? Okay, well, I might just, if, if yeah. someone else has. Um, so my perception sure, of, of, of U.S. banking is very much unit banking at the time. And so what's the link between insurance and basically the banking sector? And since saying like the, is it a case like you actually, that they, they don't talk to each other, they're like completely separate? Or is it a case like, well, you have all these local unit banks that that kind of drives like small insurance companies because essentially you don't have like large capital that can fund basically a large, or that kind of like, can work like a large insurance company? That, that's a very good question, which I do not know the answer to, I have to be honest. So that's something uh, I'll have to check. Um, but what we do know is that uh, the regulator seems to be much harder and more stricter than in the banking okay. industry. Um, uh, it was state regulation, but it was basically the same across the US. But there was a huge focus on uh, competition and on, on product prices. So you had to offer a lot of coverage, but also you couldn't really charge crazy, crazy uh, prices. So maybe indirectly they spoke to each other through the regulator, but uh, that's something I have to check, which I think it's interesting. Okay. Thank so you. it's not that the banks basically went out and basically just created their own little insurance company. These are separate sectors with separate kind of like... Yes, yes, separate, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, in the interest of time, I'll have to wrap this one up. So uh, can we all thank uh, no, Gershman? Um, we're going we're gonna to see if Pierre can join us. Hello? I can see you. Well, you're still muted, unmuting. Um, yeah, so if you just unmute yourself, then maybe... I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, Can you charades, charades an option? Um, can we play? I'm trying to figure out whether he could call in. Mm. Mm. But I don't know if the, the, the phone details. Through the, through the link, just like through the link on. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't actually know where that would be. Where would you actually find that? 
numeric Pascal telephone room systems. Oh, David, and Chris. No, it, it's, I think it has to be David. So that's the, I was just trying to figure out whether there's somewhere the, uh, the phone number, because I have never used dial in or never used phone to kind of like create that. So I don't really know how that works. Okay. Can you hear ah, me? Yes. Hey. All right. Mate, so happy to hear yeah. you. All right. Um, <laughs> wonderful. So are you able to share your screen with us? Okay, um, I can't see you, but um, hopefully you can see my screen. Is that right? Yep, uh, not yet. We can't see your screen. Oh, it's not easy. Um, <laughs> my screen, share. There yep. it is. That looks better. Yep. There I am. There we are. Good. Yes. Okay. Yep. Good. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, hanging in there. Um, the paper that I uh, uh, intend to, uh, to present is a uh, paper together with uh, Yutaka Arimoto from the Institute of Economic Research at Hitotsubashi University. Uh, it's about uh, land markets in, uh, in Indonesia and uh, property rights in land uh, during the interwar years. Uh, I have no idea uh, how much time I will have to, uh, uh, I need to deliver all this, uh, but uh, this is the summary. Uh, the paper addresses the, the claim that has been uh, around uh, for a while now that uh, rural land markets in uh, Colombia and Indonesia were inactive uh, because property rights in uh, farmlands were uh, insecure. And the reason for that argument is that uh, the colonial government, the Dutch colonial government, uh, from well up until uh, the 1940s, uh, did not invest in creating a land cadaster. That is to say, a rural land cadaster. So land was not measured, land was not certified, land ownership was not certified, and therefore it was very difficult uh, for markets to uh, to, uh, uh, to to function. And the consequence of that was that farmers were able to capitalize on farmland and that contributed to uh, rural poverty uh, uh, in, uh, in Indonesia. Um, the paper summarizes uh, qualitative evidence that exists on quite active uh, rural land markets, uh, despite the, uh, the, the general perception that uh, land markets were inactive. Uh, so I find the paper finds many instances of uh, informal land rentals uh, informal ways in which uh, farmers extended uh, credit to each other using land as uh, collateral. There's not a lot of evidence on, uh, on land sales. And the paper then argues that uh, the land tax registers, which the colonial government in Indonesia uh, put together uh, since uh, 1907, which functions, functioned until 1951, were an informal substitute uh, for the formal cluster. And uh, it then uses uh, quantitative evidence of mutations in land tax registers uh, during 1922 to 1940 uh, in the main island of uh, Java, where most people in Indonesia used to live and still live, uh, in order to trace uh, the degree to which uh, land transactions uh, took, took place. And it finds that on average about 3.5% uh, of land plots uh, that existed change uh, ownership uh, annually. Yeah, is that a lot? Is that, is that uh, uh, limited? Well, uh, it compares it uh, to um, uh, what evidence we have, and on the whole, it suggests that land markets were quite active. 
So uh, these mutations in the land tax registers are an indication that land uh, uh, markets were quite active in rural areas in uh, Java and also in some other parts of uh, uh, Indonesia where the uh, land tax uh, registers were introduced. Uh, the paper then tries to uh, analyze the impact of exogenous shocks on uh, rural land markets. Uh, for example, uh, on occasion there, were, there was a wave of crop failures uh, and that uh, should lead to an increase in the number of transactions as farmers uh, try to use their land in order to uh, borrow uh, funds. Uh, so we try to make that relationship between uh, a shock and uh, an increase in transactions, uh, mitigated, of course, for uh, the effect of other forms of uh, formal credit and informal credit uh, that exist. Uh, unfortunately, those results are not very good, uh, so I will not spend a lot of time discussing that. Um, but on the whole, the paper does conclude, and I think there is uh, uh, sufficient evidence for that, that uh, land markets in Indonesia were quite uh, active, that farmers, therefore, were capitalizing on farmland uh, that many uh, transactions uh, were conducted that had credit character, although sometimes, quite often actually, uh, we're talking about the forms of, uh, of credit that were uh, cashless, meaning that there was no cash involved, but uh, uh, a product uh, changed hands, meaning that uh, farmers promised to uh, deliver uh, an X amount of produce uh, at the end of the harvest, which would then uh, repay any, any loans that were taken out. Uh, but to the, uh, the paper, like I said, section five, I won't say too much about that, um, but the other uh, parts I think uh, will be relevant to discuss. Now, uh, this paper should be uh, understood in uh, a broader context of uh, various uh, development economics uh, studies. Uh, that have tried to emphasize that uh, a rural land cadaster is uh, very important in facilitating uh, land markets in, uh, in, in developing countries. Because a, a cadaster uh, provides secure property rights uh, and it will facilitate uh, active farmland, markets for farmland, uh, it will mobilize uh, capital for investment where farmers see opportunities for investment uh, and, and use the land for, uh, for, for borrowing. And this has been the rationale for a very extensive uh, um, program of uh, support by the World Bank uh, starting in the 1990s, uh, continuing into the 2000s. Uh, World Bank supported various uh, 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 government programs uh, to invest in the establishment of, uh, of cadastres, to identify, to measure, and to certify ownership of land plots. But does that necessarily mean that uh, there are no land markets without a cadastre? Um, if we look at institutional economics, it will suggest that there will always be a role for informal substitutes to facilitate transactions uh, involving land. And uh, my... Uh, 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 a colleague, uh, Yutaka, uh, has done some work on uh, Tokugawa, Japan, uh, looking at how the land tax register there uh, worked quite well uh, as a substitute for a uh, cadastre, a formal cadastre. Now, uh, when I started to talk to him, I realized that, uh, well, actually, colonial Indonesia also had a land tax register. And the question was, did it work well? Um, looking at uh, the literature that we have on uh, economic history of, uh, of uh, Indonesia, it's quite pessimistic about uh, land markets. Uh, two views uh, dominate. Uh, one is uh, a view that was reiterated by our colleague Anne Booth in, uh, in London, who paraphrased uh, a very old uh, uh, and quite dogmatic view of uh, Mr. Booker, uh, an economist who uh, taught uh, in the law faculty in the university, at the University of Leiden, and who is still uh, being used, being cited as an authority on uh, colonial Indonesia, even though many of his uh, views are quite outdated by now. Anyhow, his view in relation to land markets was really land has no value without labor. Um, only labor makes land productive. However, as he argued, uh, Indonesians really prefer to spend a lot of time and effort on social needs rather than economic needs. 
and therefore they are insensitive to economic incentives. And that, according to him, was the reason why there were no land markets in Indonesia as there had been in, uh, in Europe. And that helps to understand the difficulty of development in, uh, in Indonesia, he argued. And again, that view, the views of Booker uh, are still being rephrased over and again uh, in uh, the literature, by and large because he's one of the few that published in, uh, in English. Uh, and and Booth's uh, reiteration of uh, those views uh, doesn't um, uh, uh, progress the debate about this issue uh, much further either. Um, Jan Leuten van Zanden, an economic, economic historian from, from the Netherlands, together with his PhD student uh, Dan Marx, uh, issued, uh, published a book on the economic history of Indonesia uh, a few years ago. And they made the same kind of argument, but uh, on the, on, with a different basis. Uh, they said, well, the Dutch colonial government, uh, they really get uh, property rights fuzzy. Uh, and they did that on purpose because that facilitated access uh, to companies operating sugar factories uh, to, uh, to farmland. Uh, if, if property rights were clearly defined, then sugar factories would have had to pay uh, the market price for farmland, and uh, that would not have been in their interest. And the consequence, they argued, was that there was no investment in a rural land cadaster. The colonial government didn't want to do that. And therefore, there was no certainty of uh, land rights, and there was no markets for there were no markets for farmland uh, either. In both cases, the argument is well, no markets for farmland means that farmers could not capitalize on farmland, and that contributed to rural poverty. So this view, this idea that there were no land markets uh, in rural uh, Indonesia, uh, still prevails. Um, Nevertheless, uh, they could have used uh, quite a bit of uh, evidence that is readily available, uh, but that is of a qualitative nature. Uh, for example, there are two PhD theses, uh, and I'll mention them here. Uh, one by uh, Mr. Skeltoma, uh, who worked in the colonial uh, public service, who, um, uh, who uh, looked into uh, the, fair, the forms of sharecropping that existed uh, around Indonesia. And he demonstrated, with all kinds of examples, that it existed throughout Indonesia. Uh, he also demonstrated that uh, local customs tended to regulate uh, any sharecropping transactions. Uh, so there was a wide variety of ways in which uh, the markets for land, at least for sharecropping, uh, did work. Um, and uh, he also found that uh, sharecropping of land substituted uh, for the cash credit market meaning that uh, landholders would lend land uh, to each other rather than lend cash. Uh, the basic reason for that was that the interest rate uh, on cash credit was very high, uh, largely due to the fact that, yeah, certainly in uh, the, the, the more distant rural areas of uh, Indonesia, there were significant cash shortages. Uh, it was to a significant degree a cash less uh, society. So that, that's one big study, 400 pages or so, that they, they could have used. Um, there's not a lot of evidence for uh, land sales, uh, except that there was an active market for uh, cash and generally in-kind credit using land as a collateral. And it was actually a study, a PhD study by uh, an Indonesian, Mr. Subroto, uh, who in 1925 uh, demonstrated the existence of this kind of uh, in-kind credit market using land as a collateral throughout Indonesia. And that also identified that uh, credit was generally given by rich uh, rural Indonesians uh, because non-Indonesians, meaning ethnic Chinese money lenders, uh, were prohibited from owning rural land and therefore were not uh, uh, interested in accepting land as uh, collateral. Um, and again, uh, Subroto also found that local customs have regulated such uh, transactions. There was a wide range of forms of such transactions. And he identified that land foreclosures were uh, commonly an outcome of uh, an accumulation of, uh, of debt. So 
there's a lot of qualitative evidence, uh, and this is only a, a glimpse of, uh, of what was available, that would uh, disagree with the, uh, the, the views that I, uh, that I sketched uh, earlier. The question is, to what degree uh, does this qualitative evidence of active land markets hold? How active were land markets? Now, most of the evidence that uh, I will present, well, very briefly, uh, comes from the main island of, uh, of Java. Of, of Java. Uh, uh, it, it's the main island in the Indonesian archipelago. Uh, by 1940, there were 48 million people living in Java uh, and around about 25 million in the rest of the country. Java was densely populated. It still is uh, very, very densely populated. Uh, but that's where most of the evidence uh, comes from. And the evidence is based on uh, the land tax register. Uh, the land tax was uh, introduced uh, by the, the British uh, Lieutenant Governor General Thomas Raffles uh, in 1813. Uh, but until 1907, it was subject to what was uh, euphemistically called abudati, meaning a haggling between village authorities with tax collectors. There really was no objective basis uh, on which uh, tax liability of individual farmers uh, was, uh, uh, could be based. Uh, and therefore, uh, allocation of tax obligation, oh, sorry, tax liability was quite uh, well selected. And that led many village authorities to uh, abuse the system for their own benefit. Uh, in the 19th century, there was a lot of public discussion uh, in colonial Indonesia and also in the Netherlands, uh, which expressed moral outrage about this. And there were public calls for uh, a fair rural land tax system and for a rural cadaster that would record ownership of farmland uh, in order to minimize uh, abuse. Okay, so the first idea was to try and see whether a cadaster would work. Uh, there were various trials uh, in the middle, well, to, to, in the late uh, 19th century uh, with a cadaster. And it very soon demonstrated that a cadaster that would measure, record, certify uh, land plots uh, was going to be very expensive. Uh, there were high public costs involved uh, in terms of registrations and private costs as well in terms of uh, farmers themselves uh, asking for the land uh, to be, uh, be measured. So then the ideas went towards a, a compromise. And the compromise uh, gradually took shape from 1897 to 1906 uh, and took the form of a, a village-based land tax register that would measure uh, parcels of uh, several land plots, uh, so a combined parcel of uh, land plots, uh, and would also create an objective basis for the assessment of tax liability uh, because it would be combined with uh, crop cuttings. Crop cuttings would indicate the, uh, the productivity of the, of the land. So this system uh, was trialed, then introduced since 1907 on a rolling basis across uh, Java and also uh, in some other islands of uh, Indonesia. And it was in place um, until uh, 1951, when after independence of Indonesia, the Indonesian government decided to abolish it. Now, this land tax register did not certify land ownership, but it, um, it uh, did link uh, the name of the taxpayer, the land taxpayer, uh, with a particular plot of land that was uh, 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 registered in a large village-based uh, register. Um, and this is an example of uh, the kind of uh, uh, receipt, tax receipt that was uh, dished out. It identified the land plot, uh, although in this case it was uh, an urban land plot rather than a rural uh, land plot, identified the land plot and also mentions the name of the taxpayer. Okay, so there were uh, 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 at village level uh, registers uh, of the, uh, the, 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 the blocks of land uh, of which individual land plots were part. A very intricate system. And this is just one example of uh, uh, Magellan uh, residency in central Java. 
district, Kaliwungu village, Gamble Bapang, block Jumbleg 3, parcel S3. S3 had 19 plots and there were 16 land tax liable landholders. Uh, so on the right, you see the, uh, the people uh, that uh, were associated with each block. And one of them, Mr. Ali Hadjo, had four, uh, four plots. Uh, so he was doing well for himself. So this gives a, gl gives a glimpse of how intricate uh, the system was. Yeah? Now, the local courts were not able to um, accept land tax receipts as proof of ownership in cases of disputes about land about <laughs> orders or uh, foreclosures, uh, unfortunately. So formally, these land tax receipts did not play a role. Uh, and that means that uh, the formal uh, regional Volksbanken uh, village, uh, well, let's call them village banks, could not accept land tax receipts as a collateral because they had no legal status. Chinese moneylenders could not accept them either because they could not foreclose on uh, land plots. But Indonesian moneylenders uh, could informally accept them uh, because uh, they were able to foreclose and they were able to uh, lay claim to uh, the plots of land that, uh, well, uh, they, uh, that had been pledged as a, a collateral. Javier, uh, just yeah. giving you a, a time warning. Uh, yeah, okay. A couple more minutes. Yes. That'd be good. I, so uh, the land tax service uh, would publish uh, for several years uh, the details of the mutations in the land tax register. Uh, and I created, uh, on the basis of that kind of material, this, uh, this chart. Uh, the total numbers of uh, mutations in the land tax register, and they amount to significant uh, numbers. Um, the main categories, the main reasons for changes in uh, land tax, the land tax register were uh, sale and purchase, well, that's, uh, that's uh, commercial transactions, death and inheritance, basically uh, uh, farmers leaving land to their, uh, to, their, uh, to their sons, of course, and a large category of mainly, uh, yeah, giftings, uh, as in uh, uh, gifts of, uh, of land. Uh, you can see that there was there is some fluctuation, uh, by and large, caused by a change in the land of land tax liability calculation and definition that created uncertainty for buyers and that led to a dip. Uh, and of course, the crisis uh, following 1929 um, also caused a, a dip. Um, the big problem with the data was uh, what do giftings mean? Uh, what is a shrinking? What is a donation or a grant? Why would farmers grant uh, land to, uh, to other farmers? Um, I thought long and hard about that. Uh, I came to the conclusion uh, that that was a consequence of uh, uh, accumulating debt. Accumulating debt and basically the gifts of land at the end was uh, signing over of responsibility for uh, paying of land tax to the new owner by the indebted uh, landholder. So using the commercial transactions that were recorded and adding to that a percentage of uh, the, um, the uh, uh, let's say adding to that an estimate of the gifts, uh, gives me this number, uh, around about 3.5% of the plots changed ownership every, uh, every year. And that, to me, is an indication of active land markets. It compares to uh, the only one study that exists of this issue of uh, land plots uh, changing ownership, 6% uh, in East Java uh, in 1970 to 1990. And this is, of course, a minimum estimate because not all credit transactions with uh, land plots uh, placed as a collateral uh, ended with a change of uh, ownership. So on the whole, uh, uh, it indicates active land markets. Now, the next bit, uh, I'm not going to discuss this, uh, is uh, an effort to try and see whether uh, land markets uh, worked 
in a sense that they responded to external shocks. Uh, we do have uh, the data, but uh, they don't quite show what we uh, would like them to show, uh, and for that matter, uh, other results need further consideration. So we're still working on that. But on the whole, our conclusion is uh, active land markets, 1920s, 1930s in Indonesia. Let me leave it at that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pierre. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just very short questions. As why you take 3.5% as an indicator for active uh, land markets. Uh, can you find some other benchmark, for example, from Korea, Japan, or ancient Japan, or, or Taiwan, for example, as a comparison? Um, no, we didn't find a comparable uh, indicator. Uh, except for India, and now I forgot what I wrote about India in uh, in the paper. Uh, but the number that the uh, researchers for India came up with was less than one percent of plots changing hands, and that to them was an indication of uh, uh, not very active land markets. In the case of India, in the 1980s, uh, so. Relative to that, uh, land markets in Java, 1920s, 30s, were much more active. Other questions? Uh, Martin, yeah, Martin. yeah, I've yeah. written you a question, which in a nutshell is, is really along the lines of, is the market or is the land ownership there more feudal than market-based in the sense that family ties was extremely important and is this partially an explanation for the use of land as a as a good for transfer for paying off debts but you always ultimately owned it as a family unless you really formally transferred it to somebody else you used it as a a, a short-term way of paying debt etc Uh, yes, there's a difference between land use and land ownership. Um, we, we know more about land use than, the, than actual ownership. That's the reason why there is some confusion about whether there were active land markets or, uh, or not. Um, uh, even these days, uh, there, there are difficulties uh, in Indonesia uh, to, with the creation of a, a cadaster, which uh, certifies uh, ownership. Uh, it is still largely incomplete because the cost to uh, landholders uh, is, is quite high. Um, meaning that even today, uh, substitute ways of uh, uh, demonstrating uh, right to land, uh, be it control or ownership or, or use, um, are still being used. Substitute ways of, of doing that. It's not necessarily a land ownership certificate uh, uh, granted by the uh, uh, by the. Uh, uh, cadastre, of course, the, 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 the local cadastre agency that defines that. Um, much so, those substitute ways of identifying rights to land are still being used when it comes to uh, legal cases that are going in front of the uh, court. The court still accepts substitute uh, ways of uh, uh, demonstrating rights to land in order to pass uh, judgment about who owns the land or not. Um, disregarding the fact that uh, those are sitting in, uh, in judgment uh, are subject to other influences uh, as well. Uh, let's not get there. Uh, we might have to leave it there, uh, maybe take it offline if, uh, if you'd like. Uh, I do believe uh, this, this, one, this one's done, we made it. Um, we have like a conference close session. I don't really know what's in there, but um, I do believe that that's, that's a thing. So I'm gonna jump off this and go into that one.